Greetings, Guardians, my name is Bife here. It's a pretty calamitous time in Destiny's story right now. With the Witness bearing down on us and the cataclysmic war between light and dark approaching, we're going to need all the help we can get. But then again, we've never needed an excuse like that or a legitimate reason to chase after more powerful weapons. Today, I wanted to talk about some of those weapons, and the ones that we absolutely might want to get our hands on if we're going to have a fight against the Witness. I'm going to talk about a few weapons that people will already know about, and then I'm going to talk about some weapons that are either mentioned in the lore or hinted to by it. Some of these weapons will also not be something that you can see in your inventory, especially with the scale of the conflict that we're about to undertake. I think it's really important that we expand the definition of what we think of when we think of a weapon. A weapon in these contexts can be anything from a firearm that you'll wield with just a single hand, or it could be a spacefaring vessel, or it could be a particular piece of technology, or it could even be a cosmic force beyond our understanding. The point is, we need weapons, and we need to use them against the Witness. As a result, you might see a few more similar videos with a similar format to this one. All of that depends on whether you enjoy this video or not. Also, Destiny has a lot of phenomenal guns, and some of them have been forgotten, so I think it's worth talking about this. But first, a word from our sponsors on this video, Factor. With Factor, you can get fresh, ready-made meals delivered to your doorstep. Factor's chef-created meals are fresh and designed by dietitians to ensure every meal is packed with premium, proper nutrition. It's easy for my wife and I to get carried away with work when we're in the middle of a really busy work week. And when that happens, we want something that's really simple to prepare and cook. And also something that's nutritious. We can't let our health go nowadays. We're both trying to get more conscious about health and fitness, and that starts with good eating practices. Factor helps us to accomplish that. Factor helps us to cut out the stressful prep and lets us bring a meal together in minutes. Factor even offers meals for all dietary needs and desires, whether that's keto, low calorie, vegan, or vegetarian. Most importantly, it's a flexible service. There are well over 27 meal options each week, meaning that there's something for everyone and you have plenty of choice. Meal plans range from 4 to 18 meals per week, and with Factor, you can add or subtract meals based on what you need. You can modify your food preferences or even skip a week if you're going away for a period of time. There really is a lot of built-in flexibility. Use my link or go to go.factor75.com and use code POGBIFE120 for $120 off now. Thank you so much to Factor for sponsoring this video. Anyway, back to the lore. So let's start with something that Destiny veterans will most definitely remember and will almost certainly be thinking about, and that is the Touch of Malice. This is an exotic scout rifle from the Taken King expansion, but that's really not a fitting description considering how important this exotic really is. It's a bit like describing a train as a big hunk of metal that moves very fast. You don't get the essence of it. You see, the Touch of Malice was constructed by Eris Morn, who found the designs for it hidden in the calcified fragments that made up the Books of Sorrow. These designs were deliberately left behind by Oryx the Taken King, the brother of Savathun the Witch Queen and the original Sovereign of the Hive. And Eris knew this when she was building the original Touch of Malice with our assistance. The fact that she did know this is very important, by the way. The reason it's important is that the intent that Oryx divined for the Touch of Malice was that of a sort of insurance policy. He knew that there might be a being so mighty in the sword logic that it would defeat him. He vowed that if this were to ever happen, he would ensure that he would live on through this greater champion of the sword logic, that he would do so by leaving them the plans to a weapon so powerful that it had his own ravenous heart at its core. Through this weapon, Oryx would live on and would become one with the being that killed him, allowing him to continue to embody the sword logic's truth. Eris Morn constructed the weapon knowing all of this, knowing that it was Oryx's gambit to continue his own survival, and constructed it anyway with very different reasons in mind. She knew that a weapon of terrible power such as this could be used to more easily destroy the Hive in the future, and that the weapon itself was capable of incredible destruction. She had been under an incredible amount of pain and trauma thanks to her stint in the Hellmouth and to seeing the death of her other fire team members at the hand of Crota and his minions. 
and she promised that by creating the Touch of Malice, she would repay every Touch of Malice that the Hive had dealt to her and her lost fire team. hence the weapon's name. This was the weapon that really popularized the fun destiny trend of us sticking Hive Gods and other powerful constructs into guns, a trend that has been followed up somewhat by the addition of the Whisper of the Worm and Parasite, as well as a bunch of others. The Touch of Malice is important for this exact reason. It contains all the power of Oryx that might remain, and it's a powerful artifact of darkness. In the process of Forsaken, Shadowkeep, and Beyond Light, we've accepted that if we're going to fight the Witness, we need to be willing to use the forces of both darkness and light. And as a result, the Touch of Malice is a weapon that seems well suited to being turned on its creators by proxy. I can only imagine that Oryx would be both horrified and pleased to see us turn his energies against the Deep itself. It would be an affront against the god that he believed in, and yet it would acknowledge the creed of that god, and would point to the truth that Oryx believed in. But for us, this would be a weapon capable of breaking entire worlds apart given the right opportunity. Oryx has slaughtered trillions in his lifetime. In death, he might still be responsible for more. The next weapon that we need to take a look at is also related to the Taken King quite directly, and it's something that I'm sure, again, Destiny veterans will also be missing, and that is the surviving fragment of Oryx's sword, Willbreaker, if it does survive. This is a big question mark, because much like the Touch of Malice, it's unclear if there's anything left of it after the vaults were destroyed by the Red Legion at the beginning of Destiny 2. Now, I say the surviving shard of Willbreaker because in the Taken King, we take the shard of Oryx's sword after defeating him for the first time and forged it into three new potential blades. Canonically, I'm not sure which one is the real one, although Bungie is very likely to have kept things loose on the canon for this. There was the Arc Sword a Bolt Caster, the Solar Sword Ray's Lighter, and the Void Sword Dark Drinker. Each of these manifested the power of Willbreaker in a different way and with a different element, and each of them was powerful in their own right. I think Ray's Lighter and Dark Drinker easily fight it out for the note of which was more iconic, but the point of their creation remains the same. At the heart of each blade lies the fragment of Oryx's original sword, Willbreaker. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because Oryx's sword has been used to put entire worlds, thousands of them, to the torch. It was a direct expression of his power as the Sovereign of the Hive and the Taken King, but the process of purifying the blade and transforming it into one of the three exotic swords is what makes these fragments worth pursuing and most fascinating. You see, these swords have really strange properties when you consider that they're made of a rare material called Hadium. It's a metal that reacts to whatever energy it's in proximity to. We find it in Hadium flakes across the Dreadnought around Saturn, and those Hadium Flakes are imbued with a terrible darkness. Oryx's Blade Willbreaker was supposedly forged of Hadium too, and originally an artifact of terrible darkness like this wielded by the Taken King might have been neutral in terms of its energy, but it's been surrounded by dark energy for thousands of years, and therefore it was an artifact of terrible darkness. When we purified the blade, we turned it from a weapon of darkness into a weapon of balance, and then finally, as the exotic version was forged from the legendary version, we turned it into a weapon of light. Now, it's this Hadium property that I really want to highlight when it comes to this weapon, because not only has it proven its metal by being a weapon wielded by both us and Oryx, but also I think it's important to remember that as we've embraced the darkness, it's become more and more clear that a weapon such as this, made of this particular material, might hold for us Guardians boundless potential, and I say that because we have been freed from the trappings of the binary morality behind light and dark. Most Guardians now use both. We now wield the powers of both sides of the paracausal spectrum, and I'm not sure if this is how it works, because in the Destiny 1 quest it very much seemed like we had to balance out and then overpower the darkness within Willbreaker's shard in order to create our own blade, and that the Hadium could only realistically accept the paracausal energies of one side of the spectrum. But imagine for a second if you could balance the powers of both light and dark into a blade like that. A blade made of Hadium with this in mind. That might be something 
truly devastating. Something that could bring any power of paracausality to heal. Granted, it's not guaranteed that this is actually how the mechanics would work, but even if you're just getting a sword that's empowered strongly by either the light or darkness, that's definitely a weapon that could be used against the witness in any battle. And I don't think anyone is going to shake a stick at the idea of reclaiming an old raise lighter or a dark drinker. Destiny 1 veterans understand the power of these swords, and a Destiny 2 iteration of them juiced up with new capabilities and the new abilities that we have now with swords might be something worth considering as a great implement in combat against the Witness. Next up, we're continuing the trend of talking about swords, but we're going to be jumping into a totally different part of Destiny's story. We're going to be talking about the Iron Lords. Now, there are a ton of legendary weapons that the Iron Lords used, and I don't mean that in the strict game sense of they are legendary, purple quality weapons. I mean that in the sense that they really are legendary. Felwinter's Lie, Ephrodite's Spear, Yolda's Hammer, Timur's Lash, these are some of the more iconic weapons in question that the Iron Lords have made famous. The romantic naming conventions of the Iron Banner's original weapons means that the weapons are often not what they say they are. Yolda's hammer, for example, is not a hammer, it's a machine gun. However, there is one weapon that completely breaks this convention by being exactly what it says. That is Radagast's blade. And that is something which means we need to start breaking down the mythology behind what the Iron Banner is based on. To get out of the Destiny universe and into what's behind the writing of Destiny for a bit, I think it's worth acknowledging that Destiny is commonly based on a lot of different mythological stories from around our real world. The one that the Iron Lords is commonly based upon is that of Arthurian mythology. Yes, the legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table is definitely the correct inspiration for the Iron Lords. Now, I want you to go ahead and consider that for a second and understand where that takes us. For those of you who have an idea of what that means, maybe you get it. For those of you who don't, stick with me. The original mythos of the Knights of the Round Table and all of that does not exist. There is no single definitive version of the story of King Arthur and his knights because it's less of a definitive tale and more a series of ideas. It is not something that you can look to and find the original printed version because, honestly, the original printed versions of the story morph and change and some of the ideas that were added to it do not make their way into the original mythos. Lancelot, for example, is one of the earlier additions to the Arthurian mythos and yet wasn't in the original. Worth remembering that. Keep in mind as well when I say original, this is merely the earliest copy of the myth that we can find in writing, which is to say that it could have existed in an oral tradition for hundreds of years before it was ever written down. However, there are some things that, even if you are looking into the mythos generally, will ring true and thematically are brought up most commonly. These include ideas such as Arthur's death by betrayal at the hands of Mordred, the story of Lancelot and Guinevere, and the cast of key knights that made up the Knights of the Round Table, such as Bedivere or Percival. This also, of course, includes the infamous edition of Merlin, who in various different times has either been merely an advisor when it has been less acceptable for him to be seen as a wizard, and has changed to that of some kind of druid or sage when the timing was right. Of course, all of this leads back to the point that the Iron Lords are based very closely on Arthurian mythos. And in order to understand that, you need to simply look at one idea that has been expressed by more contemporary and also some older versions of the mythos, which is that the Knights of the Round Table saw King Arthur as a first amongst equals. This is to say that yes, he was the king of the land and he was the one that they served, but ultimately when they sat at the Round Table, they were all brothers in arms and that they realistically didn't have a single leader. Things were done in a more democratic way by consensus and other perspectives were considered. Now, it's worth remembering this because this is one of the founding principles upon which the Iron Lords are based. And we actually have a little note in the lore about the founding members of the Iron Lords, the original four that started the process of their creation. Namely, we have the one that truly instigated it all and named them. And that is a light bearer, who was turned Iron Lord, known as Radagast 
who started the Iron Lords in the presence of Yolda, Saladin, and Perun. For those of you who don't realize it, Radagast is the destiny analogue to King Arthur, with the exemplification of the point made that he is seen as the first amongst equals of the Iron Lords. Radagast is also an analogue to King Arthur in another way. Both of them had a mythical weapon that they wielded. For King Arthur, it was the blade known as Excalibur. For our Iron Lord Radagast, it was the less grandly named Radagast's Blade. Radagast's Blade was an artifact that you could acquire as a Titan back in Destiny 1, when artifacts were a whole lot less broken and didn't give you things like classy restoration. It is pictured as the broken tip of a longsword or greatsword, and its flavor text reads that so long as this sword was whole, the Iron Banner could not be broken. We can, I believe, in the opening cutscenes of Rise of Iron, even see Radagast using this blade against Rasputin's unleashed Siva swarms in the Site 6 complex. We therefore can sort of surmise that the blade might still be recoverable, and that part of it, at very least, might still be stuck in the Siva core at Site 6. If we could recover this blade, we might discover a remarkably powerful artifact of the light, but also it would be a powerful symbol for humanity and an indication that the Guardians still hold the mantle of the greatest protectors of the free peoples of the Last City. Moving on to something that's a little bigger than just a blade though, I think we need to talk about the Oxa machine. What is Oxa, I hear you ask, as you may have heard it from the end of Insight Terminus? Well, I'll tell you, it's to do with the Scions. The Oxa machine is a legendary device that was once used by the Scions to achieve a form of clairvoyance. This is a powerful device that allowed Scions to predict the future as well as gain a perfect view of the past. The device was destroyed by the Cabal Empire when they conquered and enslaved the Scions. The ability to see into the past with perfect clarity is already an exceptional tactical tool, but the ability to predict the future is what makes this an even more relevant tactical asset for the Scions today. It's also worth remembering that it was not destroyed permanently. The freeborn Scion Otzot is responsible for having rebuilt the Oxa machine during the time of Kallus' empire, and she used it to pass messages between the different conspirators of the Midnight Coup. The Oxa machine is an incredibly powerful device, and there are hints that it might even have something to do with the Vex and their technology. The fact that we discover a data artifact in the Insight Terminus strike called Oxa was last accessed by either an Emsund-12 or an Otsot is something that clearly cannot be a coincidence. First of all, take a look at the name Otsot. Yes, that is the name of the Freeborn Scion that I mentioned earlier, who rebuilt the Ox machine. Secondly, Emsund-12. That probably stands for Maya Sundaresh-12, as in the 12th of 227 copies of Maya Sundaresh that was released into the Vex Citadel on Venus to explore the Vex network. This means that there's an Ishtar Research Collective member who already knows how powerful this is and was probably trying to access it. And then you need to simply look at the strike name in which we hear this dialogue, Insight Terminus, as in a place where you might get an insight. Can't be coincidence in my mind. So if there is some means by which the Scions are using the Vex's power to help predict the future, then this device is clearly powerful. The ability of clairvoyance is one that should not be underestimated, and much as it may have been ruinous to some, it's been salvation for others. I think that even if we don't intend to use such a device, given that paracausal forces are in the works on both sides of this battle, I think that it's a tactical engine that we shouldn't be underestimating or allowing the enemy to use. It's not intended to be a weapon in the sense that it doesn't shoot anything that can be used as a physical projectile. It's not a ship in a fleet. But any savvy commander in a war knows that information is power, and that information that informs logistics is half of the battle. So, if we are able to acquire the Oxa, even just so we could keep it away from the Scion defectors, that would be a remarkable victory against the Witness, and it would be a powerful weapon that we might be able to deprive our enemies from. Finally, I wanted to talk about another massive weapon that goes way beyond the scale of simply a gun. And that weapon is that of the Awoken Harbingers. This is a force that was mobilized by the Awoken against both the Elixni and the Hive, and it's something that has proven exceptionally powerful in fleet battles. 
and could even decimate the witnesses' auxiliary forces, that is to say, forces that aren't made up of pyramid ships, forces such as Callus's loyalists, or any fallen from the House of Salvation that might choose to fight against us. The Harbingers are the reason that the largest asteroid in the Asteroid Belt series is destroyed in Destiny's timeline, and it's the reason that the fleet surrounding Oryx's Dreadnought was completely decimated. As best we can tell, the Harbingers can be summoned by the paracausal abilities of the Queen and her Techians. They are powerful servants of the Queen and the Awoken, and are described as though they are somehow alive. The Techian Shurochi describes them as whispering strange songs in a language that the Techians thought they ought to know. She describes how they were beautiful, with ageless, unfettered minds, and how they twined their way through the mists of the Dreaming City. The Techians are meant to have been able to bond themselves to individual Harbingers, and thus utilize them in some way. We've seen them in action during the Battle of Saturn cutscene at the start of the Taken King, and it appears that their powers include the ability to create strong fields of gravity that can rip apart whole ships and debris within space, or perhaps simply create gravity wells so powerful that ships are pulled into each other and surrounding debris and are torn to shreds. We also know that these forces were powerful enough to rip apart an entire asteroid, which for context is not small. Ceres is comparable to some of the moons in the system. Ceres is big. Keep that in mind, this is like them destroying a small planet, and the reaction of that in terms of casualties is very measurable, because when the Awoken did destroy Ceres, it was because there was a giant fleet from the House of Wolves loitering above it, and when they did destroy that asteroid, something between 500,000 and a million Elixni within the House of Wolves died. That's the power of the Harbingers, measured in lives. That is not something to underestimate. Now again, the number of Harbingers remaining is a little unclear, because the game actually contradicts itself on this. Shuro Chi, in the Forsaken content that we got for the Shuro Chi patrols, states that all the Harbingers are dead except for one that Marasov has control over. But Marasov contradicts this, because in the Season of the Hunt, she stated that she has, alongside Awoken Warfleets, deployed Harbingers, plural. So it's not really clear how many of the Harbingers there are left, but their ability to decimate a fleet as powerful as that of Oryx or the House of Wolves, their ability to tear apart an entire asteroid that's almost the size of a small planet, and their clear connection to the Awoken means that we should absolutely take them seriously. If you were to pit, say, one Harbinger against something like, say, the Leviathan, I might actually prefer the Harbinger's chances on that one. Now, none of these weapons are capable of destroying a pyramid. That's actually something that might be a little disappointing to you, but it's something that matters, especially for the future of the content in Destiny that we're about to experience in Lightfall. But I actually want to go ahead and discuss that idea of what could destroy a pyramid in a couple of videos following up from this. Namely, we're going to talk about what makes the pyramids so strong, and the one instance where Mara Sov might have actually done it. So, let's go ahead and leave that for now, but if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like. And if you want more content from Destiny's Lore, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe. If you have your own thoughts on some of the most powerful weapons in Destiny, go ahead and leave them down below. I'd love to see everyone's really out-of-the-box ideas for the most powerful weapons. I know, yes, Telesto is absolutely on that list, and yes, the mention of the Harbingers there is actually hilariously linked in with Telesto in some way, but it's also worth remembering that there are things out there in Destiny that we have not seen which are remarkably, terrifyingly powerful. So if you can think of something that I've not, go ahead and leave it down below in the comments section. Heck, if there's a comment that gets a ton of upvotes and we make another video like this on weapons in Destiny that we shouldn't forget about, heck, maybe I'll actually include that comment as a primer for talking about that particular weapon. But in the meantime, do know that, as per usual, your viewership is quite enough for me and that my name has been my name is Bife, Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.